Hello, welcome. Today I'm talking about three mistakes that I see parents make when feeding their picky eaters. So if we haven't met, my name is Jennifer House. I'm a registered dietitian with First Step Nutrition and mom of three, one ex-picky eater too. So, you know, I understand um, what it feels like to feed a picky eater. And I also have a Facebook group called The Nourish Family and I ask parents what their main struggle is when feeding their kids when they come into the group. And I hear things like, um, my daughter refuses to eat meals that we make for the whole family. She'll only eat processed meats and I'm tired of making multiple meals. Or my kid won't touch any vegetables unless I puree or hide it. Or my preschooler won't eat unless I spoon feed him. And even with my own friends, I notice that when they come over and are feeding their kids, I don't know if this is always how their meals go or if it's because they know I'm a dietitian and want the kids to eat extra well, that they really micromanage how much their kid is eating. Take another bite, try one bite of this, finish your vegetables before you go play. Just seems like so much work. Um, and I know, I know why parents use these tactics because you're worried that your child isn't getting what they need. And you know, we all want our kids to grow up to be healthy, have strong immune systems, have a healthy relationship with food, and then a wrench is just thrown in there when they won't eat anything and dinner becomes a nightmare with people whining, <laughs> crying, maybe the kids, maybe the parents, um, and you're worried your kid is not getting enough to grow well, maybe their food selection is very limited or becoming more and more limited with time, and everyone just hates coming to the table and we want dinner to be a positive place and the table to be a positive place. And I know as parents struggling to feed picky eaters, we just want our kids to try new foods without have us having to, you know, make them, basically. We want to end the yelling and the tears at the table and stop stressing about how much our kid's eating. So I'm gonna go right into the top three mistakes I see now. And the first one is pressure. And a study in the Journal of Appetite found that in 142 kindergarten kids, 85% of the parents were um, trying to get their kids to eat more. So this is a very common tactic. You know, there are obvious ways of pressure, like you have to finish your vegetables or you have to take a bite of everything or the three bite rule or whatever it is. But there's also a lot of um, kind of hidden forms of pressure that are more subtle that you might not even realize your child takes as pressure. And these are things like um, telling him it's healthy, he needs it to grow, comparing your child's intake to their sibling's intake, um, using a sticker rewards chart or praising them for eating, guilting them for not eating because it took you a long time to make the meal. And research shows that pressure actually has the opposite effect of what we intend. And lots of studies show this, but just briefly to share one with you, it was a, an experimental study with 27 preschooler kids and the researchers wanted to look at whether pressuring the kids to eat um, affected their food intake and the preference for the food. And what they found was that the children consumed more food when they were not pressured to eat, and they also made fewer negative comments about the food. And children who were pressured to eat actually had lower BMI scores, so they weighed less. So essentially, you know, when kids were pressured, they ended up eating less and liking and disliking the food more because pressure leads to, you know, decreasing their appetite, whether it's because they want to win the battle or because they're stressed when they come to the table. You know, if you're stressed, you have high cortisol hormones and that is not conducive to, you know, having an appetite and wanting to eat. It also makes them hate that food even more. And studies in adults show this too. So even in adults who were pressured to eat a certain food as a child, they continue to hate that food even as an adult, just because they, their parents tried to make them eat it. And what happens um, when we bribe our kids with dessert, so make them finish their vegetables or dinner before they eat dessert, is this also backfires. It just creates a sweet tooth. So it puts that dessert up on a pedestal and is telling your child that they have to get through the yucky vegetables or yucky dinner before they get this more desirable sweet dessert, which now is more of a forbidden food. And pressure also disrupts your child's natural appetite, even with praise. Like we want our children to eat because they're hungry. They are in tune with their appetite and we want them to keep that skill. We don't want them to eat because you're making them or to please mom and dad or for a sticker or whatever it is. So the second reason why, um, or mistake I see when parents are feeding picky eaters is not really understanding normal children's growth and appetite 
and that act tends to lead to pressure, right? So if you look at the growth chart, you'll see that children are not growing as quickly after a year. Their growth rate slows down, so it's very normal for their appetite to slow down, which um, tends to make some parents nervous. And their appetites are very erratic, like maybe they're not growing much that week, or your child is teething, um, or they're getting sick, so they'll not eat, eat pretty much nothing for a couple days in a row, and they tend to make up for it the next the next week and that's very normal so their appetite goes like this and adults tend our appetite goes like this so we expect kids to be the same but they're just not and another thing to point out about normal growth is for the growth chart the 50th percentile is not your goal it's not your child's goal it just means 50 percent of kids are larger and 50 percent are smaller and you have to take genetics into account as well i hear from so many parents that are physically small people and they are disappointed that their baby is small like they want a big baby and they expect their baby and or child to be eating more um, so genetics certainly play a part of it and as long as your child is growing along their curve no matter where that is even if it's below the curve as long as they're growing at a steady rate instead of flatlining or decreasing their weight then you know at least they're getting enough food they're getting enough calories to grow enough nutrients is another thing right like maybe the diet's not balanced and they're not meeting their nutrient needs but at least you know they're getting enough food if they are um, growing along the curve and as for normal development it's very common for kids to become picky between 15 to 18 months generally before two years and one reason is um, because they're exerting their independence and they're learning how to do that and there's very few things kids have control over one is whether they eat and also if we provide them with attention whether positive or negative kids like that so you know giving your child attention constantly at the dinner table um, they like that whether it's positive or negative so try and keep you know dinner conversations neutral <laughs> instead of about how much your kids eating and also children do have more sensitive taste buds. You know, it's difficult for them to like stronger flavors. They tend to like sweet foods because sweet denotes an easy source of energy and calories. And their first food, breast milk, is very sweet. Whereas bitter foods like, um, you know, vegetables might denote it's poisonous. You know, a lot of people think that kids started start to become picky at an age when they become mobile because a long time ago it would save them from crawling around in the woods and putting poisonous things in their mouth. So picky eating is a normal stage that, that most kids do, do go through. And then the third mistake I see parents making when feeding the picky eater is, is having lack of patience and consistency with one method. And I know there's so many opinions out there. Like when I took my picky eater to the doctor years ago, she told me just to give her whatever she wants to eat, which I know is shorter to cook syndrome and it just backfires because not only are you making multiple meals, but your child knows they never have to reach out and try new foods when they can get, you know, their favorite food three times a day. So I teach the Division of Responsibility and Feeding, which is endorsed by American Academy of Pediatrics, um, Canadian Pediatric Society, Dietitians of Canada, so all the major health organizations. It just seems that a lot of health professionals actually aren't aware of it. So this was created by um, Ellen Satter. So your roles in feeding are when, where, and what and your child's rules are if and how much. And often those rules tend to get crossed, so we try and control how much our kid's eating, and they try and you know snack all day and pick which certain foods they're gonna eat. But if you're able to follow your rules and let your child follow theirs, they'll be much less likely to be picky, as well as they'll grow up with a healthy relationship with food. And maybe you tried it and it didn't work, but it will work for all children. So maybe you weren't patient enough, or maybe you didn't understand how to correctly implement it. Um, you know, it's really easy for pressure to sneak in. Um, yeah, and just keep in mind that it's a long-term game. It's not our goal to get our kids to eat our broccoli tonight. It's our goal to help them grow up with a healthy relationship and love all foods. And maybe there's an underlying reason for picky eating too that you haven't addressed, which I cover in other videos and on, on my blog. So if you want some support to make dinner time more peaceful and implement the division of responsibility in your home, I do have a group coaching program called End Picky Eating. And uh, I've lowered the price to $197, changed things around a little bit. So you get uh, regular videos for six weeks with content, helping support you in the division of responsibility. And I have an OT occupational therapist come and talk about you know progressing textures and things as well. You get a community, a private Facebook group, so you're not alone. And until the end of May, I also uh, provide some coaching, so unlimited Foxer voicemail 
support for you one-on-one -on -one for your six weeks of the program. So I'll share a link below, reach out to DM me if you have questions.